Hello, everybody. This is CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax, Nova Scotia, or CKDU.ca online. Welcome, listeners. This is the community radio station of the Ohio University. And um, you're listening to Non-Duality Talk on September 23rd, 2015. I'm Jerry Katz. We're live today. Live is always scary. Guys, I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> joining me in the studio are two local gentlemen from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Lloyd Dickey. Hi, Lloyd. Nice Hi, to have Jerry. you here. <laughs> and Paul Boudreau. Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome back, Paul. Thank you. Good, good to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be back. We did an interview, I think, in June, right? Yeah, June. Is in July. June. Lloyd and Paul are co-authors of Great Book, Awakening Higher Consciousness, Guidance from Ancient Egypt and Sumer. And their website is ohiko.com, A-W-H-I-C-O.com. The topics I think we're going to get in today are mythology, ancient cultures, ecology, the Gurdjieff work, self-realization, world travel, archaeology. Can we possibly cover all of that? I don't know. <laughs> in one hour? <laughs> That's right. There's a lot going, a lot going on. And uh, Lloyd Dickey is a retired ecologist, former professor of oceanography here at Dalhousie. Mm-hmm. And um, Lloyd studied ancient Egypt for more than 40 years ago, ex explored many active sites, contributing significantly to their understanding. And Paul Boot, and also uh, um, Professor Dickey has a doctorate from the University of Toronto and a master's degree from Yale University. Paul Boudreaux has a master's from Dalhousie and explored fisheries ecology as a career in ancient myths and Ancient sites have captured Paul's uh, imagination since childhood, even before the show we were talking about. I said, you know, don't let me forget about that. Go <laughs> what is it? Go Gobekli Tepe? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to we want to get into get into that. Some so, of the uh, some of the recent, very recent finds archaeologically are. And yeah. we want to talk about this, you know, spirituality compared to. Uh, well, you you explain it later, but don't don't anyone <laughs> let me forget. So welcome to both of you. Welcome, Lloyd. Great thank to have you. you here, and welcome, Paul. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Now, somehow we have to start this. I, you know, I, 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 thinking what we can do today is just, it's an attempt at connection, maybe connect ancient civilizations with regard to uh, the experience of higher consciousness, like the sense of higher consciousness, the urge toward knowing it, the experience of higher consciousness, the sharing it, the expression of it. We can look at how this higher consciousness has been expressed in myths and even what's being uncovered archaeologically, like Paul, you were alluding to, and maybe talk about a practice that opens us to higher consciousness, namely the Gurdjieff work that Lloyd is involved in. And somehow we're going to weave all this together. So are you guys ready to give it a try? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Do my best. Do your best. <laughs> uh, uh, we were talking yesterday, Lloyd and I, about... Uh, our desire to get back to the, I think you were using the phrase origin, uh, Lloyd, that, that sort of is at the bottom of our book in terms of where this concept of higher consciousness arose originally. Which it, what? <laughs> it, it brings up a question. How does your book differ from other books on mythology? You know, where do you think it's, it mainly differs? Well, I, I don't really think it's about mythology. It's really about us. So... Um, I mean, if I can, uh, if I can say that, it's just really an exploration of uh, what are what are the finer um, finer perceptions that we could have, and uh, well, I don't know, Paul, you can probably fill in some from there. I, I, I like that, yeah, right? I like it. that right there, Lloyd. It's about when I asked you how your book differs. From other books on mythology, you said it's not about mythology; it's about us. <laughs> yeah. About us. What a powerful, what a powerful statement. Well, it's not really about mythology, as I when, say. In your course of your life, your scholarly life, just your life, when did you? Uh, when does that? That's kind of a turnaround perspective. I mean, at one point, when did you realize that mythology is about you? Uh, I wonder. <laughs> Um, well, I think I, it was because I was trying to figure out what other people must be getting from this because I, I couldn't understand why, why, uh, 
why it seems so strange to everybody else. I, I, I grew up trying to say, well, how did I think of that? And, uh, and I didn't know. I had no answer to that. And it took quite some time before I, actually before I discovered that uh, I really felt this much more when I went to Egypt than anywhere else I had ever been. I traveled a fair amount in both North and South America and in parts of Asia even. But um, I think uh, maybe a, uh, a turning point came when I, I visited in, uh, uh, in Nepal. And uh, I went up to some of those strange places there and I realized that uh, this is a whole experience that I've never had before. I don't know what, what I'm expecting, but I, I did learn a little bit about just sort of living it and to see what was going on. Living it? What, what do you mean? You say you learned about living it, the immersion in the, the, the environment? Yeah, I, I really mean the, uh, to try to feel emotionally what was going on in me and to relate that to what I was seeing. Did it come from that or does it come from my imagination? This time in Nepal, what time in your life was that? Like, How old were you and stuff? Oh, that was in 1985 or something like that. So whatever I was, <laughs> I was over 40 by that time. 30 years ago. It doesn't seem like a long time, 1985, <laughs> like you know. A long time it doesn't ago. seem like a long time ago. <laughs> when, when you say it's 30 years, it seems like a long time. Yeah. Well, but, that but was... truth be told, you've, you've told me that same or brought up that same emotion when you were in Machu Picchu, when we were at Stonehenge, when we were in Egypt. Well, it's something you've, you've explored in many places around the world, <laughs> not just in Nepal. And it always comes up the same thing. Uh, yeah. It comes yeah. up to the experience of an emotion. The investigation of it, the curiosity about it. How do I? How do you experience an emotion? Mm. Mm. Well, we know that it's different than thought, and we uh, we know it's different from sensation, and yet we somehow rather feel something in us. And uh, I think it was a question about what is this going? What's going on? What, what did you feel? What were you? What emotion were you experiencing? And, and Paul said you felt that everywhere you guys travel together. But let's, I don't know, pick one and talk about it. <laughs> or, or are they all ultimately the same? Or, or let's well, talk about that, please, if you will, Lloyd. Yeah, I, I don't, I can't really describe it better than that, I don't think I say. It's something that I never recognized before, except when I was a kid in dreams or something like that. So it had that ephemeral quality about it. As though, as though there was something there to be discovered, and yet I couldn't really put a finger on something. And I suppose that same kind of feeling probably got me into the Gurdjieff work, because the, the, what he said was that you got to know yourself always and everywhere. And what on earth does that mean? I don't know, but it sounds like it applies, you know, to your life. You traveled, you went here. And here well, and there and everywhere. Yeah, that, and you have to know yourself. So certainly, there's certainly a connection there that's apparent. Well, I think that's why I did travel a lot. I was, I was really searching for an object. Well, myself is. <laughs> searching for myself. I, I think that captures it. That's right. We're searching well, for ourselves. Well, isn't that, what else can we say? Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's a relief to me because, you know, you have the book on mythology. I've been to school, educated and all that stuff. And I never, honestly, I was never that drawn to myths. But I respect, you know, the literary aspect of it, the power. I mean, I understand the power of it, the importance and the significance. But I was never, you know, like, never had a natural drawing to it. <laughs> but um, so I'm glad, you know, you kind of get me off the hook a little bit by saying <laughs> it's about you. You know, your book isn't about mythology. I'm kind of going like, whoo, that's nice. <laughs> that's right. It's not really about, it's really not about anything else but us. Is that true for everything, basically, you think, that we come in contact with? Uh, I, I didn't quite get that. I'm sorry. Is that when you say it's, it's, uh, it's about us? 
the, the, the myths and mythologies about us. Yes, uh, that's, is that, a, that's, that's what I was trying to say. And would you say that's true for just about anything that we, any stimulus that we... Probably. I would say well, that yeah. uh, we put our stamp on almost anything, and <laughs> the real, the real uh, search is to find what's, what's real for me and what's not. And uh, I don't know where to go from there with, with uh, well, describing it. And you said this started even as a kid when you were, uh, you, well, had, you had I a can, sense of I, sense of something, or you were curious about something, curious about the emotions, or I guess I was curious about everything, and that's uh, <laughs> my father, my father and mother finally in desperation bought me a set of the Book of Knowledge. I don't yeah, know great. <laughs> Did you read the whole thing? Well, I have some no kids idea I know read how like much the, I read. I probably I thumbed through it, started of course looking at the pictures. And they had a lot of lovely Egyptian pictures in there. And I, that's probably what woke up my, mm. my interest in going to Egypt. And, uh, well, it, it just didn't stop there. And uh, sometimes I would have an experience of myself and the person who was with me wouldn't feel anything. But once in a while, someone did feel what I said I was feeling. And then we, we, we tried to trace this in various places and turned out that the Hypostyle Hall in, uh, in the Temple of Karnak at Egypt had something special to teach us. So it was a place. It wasn't just imagination. And we had the same feeling in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid as well, a, a connection exactly. of the same thing. So. The, the reproducibility of this shared emotion is is, is yeah. well certainly somebody must have written poetry maybe there's you know myth myths written something must be written that attempts to express that emotion somewhere have you found anything or maybe yeah. maybe art or maybe you just have to go to the, maybe it's it, maybe it's the experience itself maybe it's the sphinx itself it's the it's the hole you mentioned itself maybe that's maybe well, that's the poetry that describes it yeah. you got to go there well, I uh, always wondered, I wondered what one could discover about the Sphinx, because in those days they didn't have geophysical explorations or anything at all. So you could go and you could feel your, the, the, yourself there and feel what it was that seemed to be turning you on, but it, it seemed to be related to a wider universe than than just ourselves. How wide a universe? How wide a universe, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. <laughs> the universe is us. I don't, <laughs> Something like that. One goes, uh, goes in circles. I, I, well, I really appreciate your, your uh, yeah, telling us that. I think telling I, us all that. I think in our personal experience, and we've worked together for, for 40 years, we we sort of took a while to build a confidence to share some of these experiences, sort of say, hey, you felt that, hey, you felt that. And I, we built on that, that shared experience so that we could, we could find, uh, or we could, we could work to find a language in the myths. And a lot of what we put in our book has to do with finding a language to describe these yeah. indescribable moments. That's right. And finding that language in the myths. Exactly. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you have an example you can read or? Uh... Or what? Something? Or or you you don't? Or or is it too big to just kind of tease apart? It's a, a sample. <laughs> I couldn't pull something up. Could you, Lloyd? <laughs> I mean, it, no. well, I don't know. You know, we keep on exploring and keep on finding things. As Paul says, uh, the the current thing these days is Gobekli Tepe, and it turns out the Gobekli Tepe is several thousand years before the oldest part of Egypt that we ever discussed and described and, and seen. So is this a, does this mean that man's nature has been this of this same type for a very long time? For 10,000 years, we've been creating images of the sky and of animals. And Just tell us what Gobekli Tepe is, because some people may say, what's that? Just tell us what that is. I, mean, I have a note here if I'm going to just read it. Well, actually, Gobekli Tepe is a, a, an, a, a, a fairly high, a very uh, high up altitude place in western Turkey, 
and uh, uh, someone, Paul, you probably remember better than I did, someone had uh, discovered that there were here some, some intentional building had been done. So who on earth are people who 6,000 years before, or 10,000 years actually, before, the before the, the present era, had actually made some, some, some suggestion that they were looking for things that were the same as we're looking for. Something like that. So these, these temples are built of megalithic stones, huge stones, aligned to, uh, to certain uh, stars in, yeah. in the sky with uh, a very strong suggestion that they were potentially temples, but they, they were more than what would, would need to eat, sleep, reproduce, have sex, those sorts of things. This is definitely more than our common view of man. Um, and, and they were doing it 10,000 years ago. So uh, to share that same, to, to, to even imagine that 10,000 years ago, humans were having these higher thoughts long before, pick, pick something like uh, vaccinations, you know, all the things that we see as necessary for modern day life. Yeah. Uh, these guys were, were moving big rocks around. For what reason? For, for something <laughs> higher. Yeah. Um, I read on, in preparation for this, I read that uh, Gobekli Tepe, is that what it is? Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> none of us know how to pronounce it. I yeah, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> is um, only 5% of it has been um, excavated and probably maybe even much less is understood. But what, what are the implications, what you just said, Paul, of, of, of that? Well, there's a couple of, uh, well, the, the first thing is that man at that point was investing huge amount of energy that, that they would have to, you know, marshal people and food. Uh, they would they would have to marshal the the, the society uh, to create something to stargaze, um, to look beyond themselves. So this whole fiction that that ancient man was measly and starving and beating each other over the head with the bones uh, has to become into question because um, they, right, it's got to be wrong. <laughs> got to be wrong. Okay. <laughs> That's got to be wrong. Um, and, and so our, our our interest in higher consciousness. Has has a much longer uh, lineage than, than uh, we we've ever imagined, and uh, uh, this sort of builds on on what we experience in, in Egypt, which is uh, what five thousand years old, uh, five thousand yeah, years about before five thousand BC. Uh, well, actually, the oldest uh, written stuff there is about three thousand BC. BC, so five thousand years ago. So this is this is significant to us that that uh, that weren't we we weren't primitive in the sense of, you know, just grunting and groaning. We were looking at the stars and, and viewing stars. Yeah. I think, L Lloyd, what you're then referring to is, uh, is that uh, your search, your emotional experiences that you want to ex explore, mm -hmm. uh, like you said, it, it, was, it was known by the people that Paul is describing. It must have been known must in have their been. own way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so there's I mean. an ancient connection right now. Anyone listening right now who has that sense of you know mystery in the universe, mystery of their existence. The you look up at the stars at night and you see the infinity. Well, that's just, it. just a question. Absolutely no different than guys hanging around ten thousand years ago. No, no nothing, different. Not at all. But yet somehow or other, someone began to make sense of it. In, in our book, we particularly tackle the literature. We, we go back to the origins of literature, the, the, the very first writings of man. And uh, because we can approach that in, in a way different than, than stones and, and, and stars, which are equally important. Um, and what we found is, is, is in our, uh, as we look at Sumerian and ancient Egyptian, uh, the, the initial literature of man, first ones that we have access to, is talking about these very highest aspirations of man, much like the stone work at, at Quebec Le Tepe, we think is talking to the highest aspirations of man. The literature we find in, in the pyramid text to us is, is talking about spiritual development. It's not talking about, you know, how many, how much corn I grow or, right. you know, it, it talks about the highest aspirations. So how, how is it that, that, that man that long ago with, with what could be seen as, as, limited capacity mm -hmm. are struggling to build these huge pyramids with f fantastic stories with fantastic carvings 
uh, inside the pyramid. So all along our history, we, we re-encounter this, this, this desire, this striving, I guess, for the higher, whether it's in stone or text. Exactly, yeah. So you've been in some of the uh, the pyramids, the Pyramid of Unas, and, and, yes, and seen the skill at that time. Oh, yeah, and, well, to feel the scale of it is uh, <laughs> what, you ha what you do. I mean, uh, there's nothing you do. You just just open yourself to it, and suddenly... You can you have a sense of some great mystery that I'm not understanding, but and you can what, sense. What but is you can it? Feel. Hmm? But you can sense and feel it. You don't yeah, understand. Yeah, you it. certainly can sense and feel, and so it's it's more than it's more than just ordinary thinking, feeling, and 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 acting. There's something they put together, and that's why we call it higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. There is a level of consciousness which we all think we have anyway. But what is higher consciousness? It's mm. it's something that poses a big question. And I think it's trying to get closer to what that question is all about. That, uh, well, as I say, In, began it, with, uh, yeah. with good. Well, for me, it began to be put into form by running into the Gurdjieff work. Well, I want to talk about that, but I just want to talk again about that big question. Do you think there's been any progress in 10,000 years as far as um, a society coming from higher consciousness, coming from what we're seeking, you know, that vastness? Because it seems to me that it seems that our, our entire society is set up to keep us from exploring higher consciousness. Almost that, yes. But we're, you know, it's like we've gone backwards in ten thousand years. Whereas what, what you're describing, Paul, is that that was the that was in the forefront was was developing spiritual awareness. In our world today, you know, it ain't there. <laughs> it's there, but it's hidden. <laughs> so, like, what's gone on in ten thousand years? We've devolved or something. Yeah, what's been going on for all that length of time? And we don't seem to have changed anything. We still have those that urge for the higher consciousness, for the, to understand the mystery of existence. Well, we've got the words, but the consciousness itself is something that each of us has to sell for himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so when so when we talk about your experience, and you connect with a, a, a deep emotional experience that you're not, you don't, you don't feel a need to describe in words, but you know, I think people. Can, can somehow resonate with it. Yeah. Now, someone else may have, may not, may not have that emotional connection. They may have some other uh, type of visceral or some other mental or some kind of spiritual or whatever experience. Um, so each person has to find out for themselves. That's right. What their kind of their touch point is with the uh, their other interfaces with exactly. the infinite. That's exactly you. Mm -hmm. and, and no one should imitate you, but you're certainly it's fascinating to hear about you to hear you speak about it because the way you speak you can make a person say um yeah i know what he's saying you know i don't i don't have the same exact experience but i know what he's saying in my own way mm -hmm. and that's important that's an important that's communication yeah so how you're, you're talking about go beyond that yeah and uh i suppose that's the the burden of our whole uh exploration as paul says we went to been to the the pyramids of egypt and uh ever i mean the greatest mystery is how on earth those could ever have been built because the stones are so big you couldn't lift them and they didn't have they perhaps had levers but if the best estimates people have made of uh of what they could lift would be required levers that were longer than they they could make with just ordinary things around so someone had to someone had to be you had you had to explain something that seemed to be totally inexplicable you uh, i'm not forget i'm not forgetting the gurdjieff fork but let's just stay on the pyramids again for a second so the two of you guys spent a night like in the Great Pyramid or something? Or, I mean, what was that like? Like, like being in a motel room? Was there like maid service or, you know? 
like a, like a telephone, you know, a yellow pages with the local, with the local. Wait, what's that like? What was that all about? Uh, I hardly remember. And uh, when I try to put it back into words and and experience, the it, it's a uh, it's a feeling of there being more room in in here than I'm used to feeling. You know, if I could stretch out my finger and touch something, but if I stretch out my feeling and my finger and can't touch anything, what's happening? Am I just going crazy? Or is there some other quality that I wasn't thinking about looking for? Is a qual there was a quality of the space there? Yeah, I think it's a quality of the space. Mm -hmm. Anybody else put any terms on that? I don't know. No, um, I don't know, Paul. What what was your? Hey, again, it, it's the the recurrence of that feeling in many places of the world. But the King's Chamber, of course, had a musical quality which was exceptional. Um, uh, what is it? You know, you talk about how you express it with somebody else. How do you talk <laughs> about somebody else? And and one thing that we have find in our found in our travels is that. It generally requires a state of quiet, uh, uh, sort of calm, a state of you That's know true. breathing. And whether in the Sistine Chapel or Stonehenge, if you're with you know a group of tourists that are you know doing what tourists do and they, you know chat and take pictures, mm -hmm. uh, that that often has uh, has interrupted this flow. But in, in the King's Chamber in particular, uh, we happened to be there with no one else. So just the two. Actually, it was two or three of us. And we got to sit on one side and, and sort of just sense, sense the space. And with the right conditions and the right preparation, it was it was incredibly magical. And then if you add music to it, uh, yeah, how could you not <laughs> sense <laughs> that moment? So as a teaching tool, uh, teaching space in the world, the pyramids are phenomenal. Do you remember the sound that we were able to generate? Yeah, I wish I could remember the... Uh there was a kind of a resonance that was set up just because the the room had particular um, dimensions. But of course, that means only that if you sound a particular note, you can usually hear the octave. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was that a feeling of opening up that was actually associated with that that made it made quite a big difference. Yeah, opening up and connectedness. I guess you know it seemed like everything was. Just just one. It was just yeah. It, it doesn't answer anything. What it does is just open more questions. Mm. Sure. Why not? I, and which is what you, what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I'm asking if there's any expression for what you guys have been experiencing, and 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 the inability to express it is um, is its own kind of expression, really. That's right. Mm. Like Paul was saying, you know, you sort of have to be in the silence. The silence maybe is the is the proper response. Uh, you need some preparation, I guess, uh, yeah. and, 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 yeah. so, and condition, I guess. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I lived next to the King's Chamber, the Great Pyramid, and I went there every afternoon. Would it, <laughs> would it happen? <laughs> I, I don't know, but uh, fortunate that I yeah. were able to experience it a couple times. We, we, in some ways, we make we 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 draw allusions to that feeling through our use of the word creation and creation myths. And, yeah, uh, you know that that coming, that arising of something out of chaos, uh, that in the Christian world we're all familiar. But you know, originally there was chaos. Well, I think that chaos is in us, and these moments, these situations, this preparation. You know, there's rise. something that's not just chaos. Mm, yeah. You know, there's some kind of arrangement that you, you, you weren't responsible for. Well, the fact that you can know there's chaos. I mean, that knowing is uh, can't be chaotic. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it has to have some <laughs> hold to it. Some basis for it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So one can see these things better as you go in and out or I don't, I don't think in and out is the right term, but can experience these different states. Maybe, maybe that's why it ha requires travel and one has to get away from our regular routine chaos to see something. Yeah. I think yeah. that's uh, that was... The base of the, the whole, everything we tried was uh, trying to find a um, trying to find something that was sort of material compared with this 
ephemeral feeling that um, that one has. What is it? Where does it come from? Why is it so difficult to to um, understand in our ordinary terms? Well, we 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 appeal to looking up at the stars and, and sort of saying, what is up there? Why this tremendous distance? What are we, we can't, there's no answer to why. There just is. There is something that one needs to appreciate. And, uh, and I guess we we were led by, by travel to contact it and, and try to explore something more about it. And we still come back and say, well, what about me? <laughs> I, I love where this conversation's going. You know, I mean, last time with Paul, it was about the myths, mm -hmm. the Greek and the Sumerian myth. We haven't really gotten there yet. You know, I mean, <laughs> and, and that's okay. Like I said, like I said earlier, that's, that's so cool. <laughs> that's Lloyd's fault. That's Lloyd's fault. I like it. I like it. <laughs> it is indeed. I like it. Now, um, as part of your investigation, you came across the Gurdjieff work. Con you sorry. came across the Gurdjieff work. G Gurdjieff. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Gurdjieff. So, yeah. Gurdjieff, can, you, can yeah. you tell us about that? Tell us, listeners might not know who George Gurdjieff was, and, um, and then how you stumbled into his teaching. Yeah, well, I, um, I, can't, I don't honestly remember how I actually got there originally. I think it was through a friend of mine who'd contacted somebody else and someone had, in those days we were in Toronto and this woman had come from from uh, New York and it seemed like, you know, a long ways away, but somehow or other she was making some kind of sense about uh, uh, what kind of questions we were able to ask. And, uh, well, I don't know, that woke up that woke up a, a chord in me that said, "Well, I need to, I need to follow up questions like this. This is what's really interesting to me." What kind of questions on the, like your true nature and or stuff like that, or yeah. your your true self? What is my true nature? I mean, the, it may not be answerable, but the question is terribly important. <laughs> and so, how do I even ask the question intelligently? And uh, I don't know where to go about it from there, Paul. What? Is... Well, well, well. For me, I, I mean, one of the, the the concepts in the Gurdjieff work is the multiple eyes, and it was the first time I encountered <laughs> the many eyes in me, and uh, you know, just some of those insights allow you to see yourself in a different way. There's no going back once you sort of really encounter the multiple eyes, and you mm -hmm. see the your appetites in line with your, you know, that that mind brain thing that we're taught to trust um so the body emotion sensation dichotomy dichotomy uh, well, uh, really split. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sort of contributed to to this lifelong striving to understand who i am or maybe it's more what i'm what i'm not i guess are, are you paul are you involved in the gurji fork too i i have been over time and, yeah. and uh certainly read the read the books and it's still a uh, main topic of discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think we all have to find our own way and, and uh, uh, those ways are different, but I think they all have to contribute to our own development. Well, you do know that certain personalities fit with you and certain others don't. And that's, a, that's really a consideration when you get into things like the work. I mean, what what about p particular people's r points of view can contribute to your understanding? And what, one se what seems to block it? How do you know that this guy knows anything at all? <laughs> How do you get to agree with, this, with someone about what is happening? I mean, in, in you. Because there there's no, seems to be no proof for anything. Mm -hmm. So, just what, direct, what are the just direct experience? Direct experience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, how do you discern then? How do you discern the real from and the truth from the false? And 
Is it uh, completely intuitive? Again, I'm trying to draw words out of people, but it's fair game to say, well, you don't have to express it. Just do it. It's just uh, done or something. Yes, well, you do have to try to express something, and then you you run up against something you can't express somehow. So what does this do? <laughs> what, is it, what, what does it raise for you? And it seems to me it all comes back to saying, well, I guess it's up to me. <laughs> Where does it arise in me? This must have happened because of my uh, experiences. Is it, is it beyond myself? What is spirituality? We use that word occasionally when we dare, but what? But do we have any idea what it means? I don't know. We can go yeah. back to the guys 10,000 years ago. They probably knew. We, <laughs> we don't know. We lost it. Hey? I think we lost it when they started growing uh, wheat and grains and stuff. And Anyway, yeah. that's another topic. Yeah. <laughs> have to be careful not to answer questions you don't know the answer for. I know the answer buddy <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it's, it's very um, as I yeah. started to say at one time in the interview earlier uh, the uh, business of uh of being sort of beyond anything I could describe was was what what came to me in uh, in these adventures in the high mountains and in Nepal and that sort of thing. And where in the heck did that come from? Or where does it lead me? Mm -hmm. And I don't have any answer for that. So to this day, you don't have an answer. There's no concrete answer that you can, you know, put in a textbook. No concrete but, answer. Hmm? So is the not knowing, the not knowing, is that sufficient? Is well, that... It, sometimes it has to be, doesn't it? The not knowing. It can't end there. You, you can keep on questioning. And I suppose this is why you keep on doing it your whole life. So, Lloyd, are you, is there... Um, has, it sounds like there has not really been a resolution as far as what that is, what that mysterious feeling is within you. No, I, d I don't think so. Or, or should there be a resolution? Or could there be a resolution? <laughs> well, <laughs> not, not an answer, a resolution. Not an answer. Not an answer. But a resolution Yeah. that comes about in the same way the emotional feeling comes about, an, an internal resolution of some sort. Yeah. Is that... What's the situation with something like that? Well, I don't know where you go from here. Um, in a way, I I have to say, well, what amount? What what would be a resolution? I don't know. I mean, there are there is no concrete answer to this. So there has to be something that's that's sort of out in the in the far distance. I am remember being uh, told about a a man that I admired, who was uh, who was dying quite obviously, and uh, he 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 of course had been used to these kinds of questions, and at one point. He opened his eyes and he looked at the people around him. He said, so that's it. <laughs> and then he died. <laughs> that was the resolution. That, that was his resolution. So that's it. <laughs> that's it, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> there's a resolution that is no resolution. There is only continued study to say to Somehow or other, one can find that an, an enlarged view of any else, of everything you've known before. And uh, that has to create a new kind of understanding. I don't know what else, how else you handle it. 
Anybody, any so, answers? <laughs> so we, so what we're doing here and talking here, really the same as what was being done again 10,000 years ago among three guys sitting together. Mm -hmm. Really no different, I don't think. I don't think I don't so. think it'd be any different. No, I, 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 th I believe that I've encountered moments of more clarity, I guess, in my life. And I know that that happens rarely, happens under certain conditions. But most of my life I'm asleep, such as now, you know, I'm, yeah. I know I'm talking to him. And I guess to, for me, those glimpses of something higher motivates me to keep working. Now, whether the builders of Gobekli Tepe or the builders of the pyramids, mm -hmm. you know, what, what that meant to them, but they were highly motivated individuals, as, uh, not interested in food or the common interest in life, but something must have motivated them to build these fantastic structures. And yeah. if I can tap into that, that striving, I, I don't know where, I, yeah, I don't think there's any answer to where or why the ultimate, but right now I could try to be just a little bit more conscious here as I sit talking to you. And tomorrow I can try just a little bit more conscious. I, and it's not additive, unfortunately, or else we'd all be saints, but, yeah. but, but, you know, come back, come back to that, that the memory of, of something higher, come back to the fact that I have to keep working on it. And maybe on my, maybe on our deathbed, we'll have that, glorious moment but that can't be our objective yeah. yeah are you um lloyd are you uh pretty actively involved with the gurdjieff work well these yes days, I, I i am uh the um it's a hierarchical system and one is always looking for a leader and uh so in the early days, I, uh, I ran into a man who was said to be a son of Gurdjieff. And uh, I thought, well, this is as high as I can go, surely. And, uh, and then I, I, I said to him, well, how is it that I, I think I'm able to um, understand what you're saying? He said, well, because we're the same type. So it's a matter of type. And I don't know how we, how we go any further than that. Hmm. We're trying to explain, but by explanation, we mean we're trying to put it into terms that we ourselves ordinarily use. And uh, that that's, that's not in it. Hmm. So... How can one say, well, I don't know. <laughs> There's something I don't know. And be sure of that. <laughs> it's not so yeah. easy. But it is possible to ask, to continue to ask questions. And I suppose that's the nature of life. Yeah. The, work, the Gurdjieff work, uh, it, it's called the fourth way because it balances three different three other ways did uh, yeah the the way of the well that, yogi that, the the monk yeah. well i the, think that, that that's a good expression all right i mean there is a intellectual way and there is an emotional way and there is a sensation way right but there's something else and uh that is that's at the base of this stuff that we're that we ask questions about there is no final answer to that, surely. But there is a need for keeping on asking mm -hmm. the questions yeah. that opens up something in you. Right. And you found through the Gurdjieff work, you found some fo some way of um, organizing your yeah, perceptions helps. of um, this mystery, this unknown, some way of uh, some discipline regarding it. Yes. That's right. It gives you, it gives you a chance to um, ask yourself the questions. I mean, yeah. the big question really is, who am I? Right. And so that it, that allows you to ask that question and say, well, I can appeal to the stars. I can appeal to the to ancient times. I can appeal to something far away. But I, it's something I have to come to myself. 
because it has yeah. to be in me that this and if there's an answer something is to be found and i don't yeah. know where anyone could go beyond that beyond their own experience who am i yeah 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 and, and, and again just to uh just to uh repeat what you did then is to take that uh Inter that in personal experience and then find a discipline for investigating it within the Gurdjieff work yeah. that appears. And, and everyone can do that. You know, not everyone has to go to the Gurdjieff work. There's all kinds of you know, paths and yeah, you know, teachings sure. and teachers and organizations. And, yeah, that's right. You know, but a person has to find out what's right for them. That's right. By this is the point. Seeing Absolutely. Finding something or someone that resonates with your temperament like right. you found. Yeah. What else can one do? Like you two guys found together. You guys, <laughs> you guys found together, yeah. right? Uh, I, I yeah. guess you could say that. <laughs> I guess you could say that. Well, Forty we, years together. We seem to have found something that keeps us keeps us from being at each other's throats all yeah. the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it 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 doesn't replace this there's other needs, but it does contribute to our resolve to write and think about these things and and keep on keep on exploring mm -hmm. yeah and sense our bodies and hmm? sense our bodies and yeah. try to observe our emotions and yeah yeah and that's something anyone can do right here right now absolutely you're, you're just yourself mm -hmm. yeah you don't have to run out to a meeting or run out somewhere. Absolutely. No, you don't just sit on your couch or your, in you your car seat. You don't have to go and... anywhere, but sometimes you have to go a lot of places to discover that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you might have to, but who who knows? I mean, if, I think if you just kind of follow, follow, uh, follow maybe what's choiceless within you. You know, it's, it's like what do you have to do? Not what not what would be nice to do. You know, it would be nice to take a vacation. But what do you yeah, have no, to do? It has nothing to do with that, does it? But and, uh, and so you guys, I don't even have to ask. Your work is kind of choiceless. I mean, this is what you have to do. Yeah. There might be some aspects that you think might be nice to do, like oh, let's take a trip here or there. But on the large, <laughs> on the whole, it's like this is your investigation. This is your yeah yeah way. And could, we couldn't have done it individual. I could have done it individually. So it, so much is based on no. You you actually need need someone to to. Um bounce ideas off and and get something back because uh, we get so deeply into ourselves that we think we understand <laughs> something it doesn't take much for somebody else to come along and and uh, oh yes <laughs> forgot about that <laughs> well yeah that's, that's the problem again i think of trying to talk about whenever you talk about something you put yourself on the you know, you, you put your uh, uh you put yourself on the limb yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. You put your, your, your head out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you say anything, it's always limited. So someone will come along and chop your head off. and Or sometimes say, yes, you do. You are seeing something. You are <laughs> maybe, maybe, encouraging. Yeah. Well, you are. You yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be people who, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, you are saying something. Then there's always someone who's saying, yeah, you're saying something, but you could have said this too or yeah. whatever. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the spiritual game. And I wonder if they played that there in Gobelki, <laughs> Tepley, whatever they called it. I wonder what they called it. They probably, to... they probably called it Passaic, New Jersey. What do we Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah we don't know what they church. called it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but it's, it's been fooling around for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Is it fascinating that only 5% of the um, of that archaeological site has been discovered? I mean, what does that imply? What is that? What's going on as far as size and stuff? and? It took a long time for the original explorer to even get any funding. It, it wasn't seen as of interest to the, the mainstream archaeology. So um, it, it took a long time to, to, to make the case for even the five, to explore the 5%. Um, we're scientists, and we were talking about this yesterday in, in Shuby Park as we walked. Scientists rarely look at where those hypotheses come up. You know, I mean, once you get a hypothesis, things roll very nicely to it, test, untest. That's and right. All. But where the hypothesis come from is very, very, That's I mean, it's magical. And yeah. so I think the same thing with, with <laughs> Gobekli Tepe is who had the original idea that this was even worth looking at and how many more sites around the world, you know, require that uh, advocacy to say, yes, this is important. And then yeah. some will work out, some won't. So 
when you ask about the five percent thank god they found five percent before i died so i now know more than i did yeah and, I and we brought it into this conversation we got to get going in a, in a minute or two so do you think we kind of put we kind of did what we thought we were going <laughs> to do we didn't talk about mythology but we talked about uh higher consciousness and we brought in some of the archaeology and Egypt, ancient civilizations yeah. and gurdjieff work and <laughs> but mostly i mean lord you really kept it right on target it's like it's your own personal experience your own investigation find your own way to do that and you offer a tremendous uh teaching on that i think i don't know if i have time when i prepared for this show i highlighted a section of your book to read okay kind of longish i don't even know if i should i, mean, I think we said and everything <laughs> uh, I, I, i'm doing some editing as i go here that's okay. I, I, let me just read it. This is what you guys write in your book. We cannot help but comment on the great good for fortune that seems to be ours in this age, the beginning of the 21st century, when new discoveries, both external and internal, seem to be more and more frequent. We wish here to draw additional attention to the importance of maintaining the internal quiet patience that is necessary if we are to find ourselves in the sudden presence of new perceptions. And, and I think that's what, especially Lloyd, you were referring to, you can't express things, but you can value that internal quiet patience. That's, that's right. That yeah, I think important. that, uh, I'm glad we wrote that. <laughs> I'm glad you wrote the book, yeah. Yeah. Any final words from you guys? I don't think so. Do you have any? <laughs> <laughs> no, I... All I can say is uh, the search is never ending, so one has to make up their own, one's own self and, and uh, work for what it is. Thank you, Lloyd Dickey and Paul Boudreaux. Thank you, Jerry. Their book is Awakening Higher Consciousness, Guidance from Ancient Egypt in Sumer, which you can buy through their website, ohiko.com, A-W-H-I-C-O.com. This has been Non-Duality Talk. Our website is nonduality.org. You can hear a copy of this show on nonduality.org. I'm Jerry Katz. Thank you for listening.